first one is from Alan Schoen from Deputy. So Alan has been working with and building APIs for over 13 years, allowing him plenty of time to focus on the many different aspects that come with systems execution. He started this process as a developer, but he's moved through various specific focuses, including security, architecture, quality, and infrastructure. Alan's recent major focuses generally lean toward the automation side of life, where he finds that the biggest benefits come from helping others to reach their goals. So Alan's going to talk to us about building resiliency into your API. So Alan, over to you. Thanks, Dan. Let me get my screen going. Cool. APIs are the basis upon which so much has been constructed in our modern world. So we need to ensure that those we build and maintain are, are available when they're needed by our users. We build these systems to make data and actions available, and they're often used in some exciting and unexpected ways. The last thing we want to do is build something that entices people to build something magnificent and it then becomes unusable because we didn't plan properly. Uh, to that end, we can prepare plenty of things ahead of time and how we can best approach for a stable and long lasting lifetime of our API. By the end of my presentation today, I aim to leave you with a few ideas and tips on how you can architecture resilience into the APIs you build. These concepts and ideas are certainly not new, but they can often be overlooked until it becomes critical and cumbersome to implement them. To sum these up, we need to set and then meet expectations that we give to our users. So really I'll be covering uh, error handling, uh, applying patterns like the circuit breaker pattern, uh, liberally using caching, uh, being able to track performance over time to get a better understanding of how things work and what might need improving, and then recovering from disaster in the event that something is catastrophic. So first off, I'll chat a bit about handling errors and really error handling is more about uh, the micro level. Uh, so when, when something is potentially unexpected, at making sure that we're graceful in the way that we handle that situation. There's many different types of errors, so there's going to be many different ways that we will need to handle them. And really, we want to account for the common cases uh, to, to get the most bang for our buck in what we do actually implement and cater for. The aim in this exercise is to look at each of the locations within our API where something could go wrong and think about the best way that we can act and potentially just uh, looking to gracefully handle whatever comes up at any point in time. So for an instance, we might have this very, very basic API, uh, which is just in this case, uh, an instance, like a compute instance uh, that hits a database and there's a, some sort of consumer uh, that interacts with our API. So if an error occurs here with a query, then we, we would know what to do because we would expect that given some sort of user input, there may not be any data or something like that. But if there's something else, then what, what, what should we do? Uh, for instance, if the, the database is unreachable or the query times out, uh, what sort of a response do we give back to the user? And how would we go about detecting that something is wrong while processing a request to, to not just wait and wait and wait if we already know what the answer is going to be that there's a problem. So our first thought might be to apply some scaling. Uh, maybe the problem is just around uh, the performance side of processing the data that comes back out of the database. The, the query that we received in our API might have been entirely open-ended and there's many, many thousands, millions, however many rows of data that come back and our instances just can't process it in time. So we might say, okay, cool, let's set up some sort of uh, scaling where we can have multiple instances that can handle these API requests. 
so in this case, we would remove our one compute instance and have one to many. It's it's a pretty common type of thing, uh, but it's it's still very narrow in what it can and can't do. So the next thing we might do is uh, or let, let's say we we now add a different type of dependency. Uh, maybe we make a, a different API call from our API. Uh, we might want to gather some extra data that's relevant to the query uh, that was uh, executed by the user. So we now have this uh, API call that is made from, from our servers. It would be wise for us to think about how this API acts and reacts for that matter. Uh, we might like to know about how it performs under load or what type of response time we should expect from that. So that way, when it comes to error handling, we would know that un with certain responses from this API, we need to act a certain way. Uh, for instance, the API might tell us that, you know, if, if a particular response code is received, then we should retry, or it might tell us that we need to wait a certain amount of time before we should try again. Especially if this is in the critical path for our API, we need to be very diligent in making sure that we properly cater for this request model and make sure that our API still meets the expectations that the consumers of our API have, have come to, to grow with. Another thing that I like to do with error handling is come up with a specific structure that I use for all of my API responses. And, and this again, just provides a, an expectation that the consumer of an API can uh, rely on. So in this case, we, we have three keys in a JSON structure, um, primarily for HTTP based API. So things like uh, RPC and protobuffer would be different. They, they would have their own structures, but for a standard HTTP API with a JSON response, I'd have these three keys. The first one is the content, and that's where the query data would live. And I like to treat this as always being uh, an array of some sort. And the idea behind that is a consumer of this API would always know that there's a list of things here, but the list might be empty. Uh, so if there's any looping that goes on, then having a, a for each or some sort of uh, counter would mean that even a zero case is handled and the structure doesn't change when the number of results changes. The second key here is a, a errors list. Uh, and that's also always going to be an array even when there are no errors. Uh, and that's, again, useful in that sense. So uh, a consumer can get just count the number of items to see how many errors there are. Uh, generally, I structure each error as a string, but Objects can be used if there's additional relevant information for consumers. Th the third key then is a meta key. And this is where sort of non query information can go such as execution time or tracing information and, and just additional metadata for the request. And, and this really just forms a, an expectation from a consumer to, to be able to rely on something when they make requests to, to the API. Next up is uh, circuit breakers. And this is just, a, I think, a, a commonly known way to handle downstream API and uh, integration calls, but not necessarily widely implemented. Uh, I know a lot of people who know what the term is and, and roughly understand how it works, but I don't think I've really seen it implemented very much. Uh, and really, it's just a fuse box in that sort of way. Uh, there's a series of switches that can be automatically triggered under certain circumstances. And then there are other conditions when those fuses are essentially replaced. And the idea is that when, a, when, when everything is fine and there are all these fuses, then uh, third party API calls or whatever downstream dependencies there are, they are executed as expected. But if something trips 
the circuit breaker then the fuse blows and then those api calls and whatever integrations would not be executed anymore this is a great way to handle when uh external apis become unavailable uh, for for whatever reason so if we were to implement this into our uh, infrastructure as we've been building it up then one potential avenue is to add this component at the bottom here, which is uh, uh, a Redis instance. Uh, and that's just a key value store. Uh, it's pretty quick usually. Uh, and what we would do is have a list of our fuses uh, for our circuit breaker. And so if one of those is tripped, then we, we use this store as a way to keep track of whether things should or shouldn't be uh, enabled. And, and that essentially gives us a way to control the execution of our API and the function of our API without having to modify the code itself. The, the consideration here is around the behavior of our API under both sets of conditions or multiple sets of conditions, depending on how many circuits we have. Uh, across our API stack. So we need to think about whether, if we're retrieving data from multiple APIs, but one of them is currently out of action, do we need to change the way that we behave when we're trying to fulfill a request for a consumer? And when we combine this type of thing with a, an exponential backoff, we can start to automate the way that we uh, trigger these circuits and and better gracefully handle uh, service degradation. Another option would be to use a, a queue. Uh, so instead of having a key value store, we we place uh, jobs into a, a queue that we know that we need to process later. So when when a circuit is broken and maybe we were pushing data to an external service, uh, but that service becomes unavailable. So we would keep a copy of that data ourselves, and that way we can replay it later. Uh, and so we can put these into a queue, uh, especially a FIFO queue, so a, a first in, first out, and that way we still keep our ordering uh, in the to, to cater for the circumstance that the order by which the actions are happening from our API is required to be in the same uh, same way to get the same outcome that's desired by consumers of, of our API. U ultimately, it comes down to the different situations and the different circumstances by which our API executes to determine which sort of way we need to go. It's also quite pertinent to ensure that these rules are set up correctly. Otherwise, you could end up triggering bigger issues uh, that you were trying to solve in the first place. Uh, a good story, uh, not too long ago at Deputy, we had uh, this exact situation. Uh, we had a, a downstream API call that was uh, having some troubles, uh, but thankfully when it was, when our integration with it was implemented, there was a, an internal buffer that was set up. Uh, so instead of, uh, just failing to make these API calls. Uh, when the API call failed, a message would be created, which had the state of the request that was being made. And that would be placed into uh, this FIFO queue. And the idea was that when the API was uh, up and running again, we could just replay all of the items from the queue and send those through to the downstream API and that way there would be no data loss and uh, we would have parity with our system and the, the downstream system. The, the problem came in that the downstream API had been unavailable for such a long time that our queue filled up and it was, uh, I guess, evicting uh, messages and not accepting new messages and that was then causing issues inside of our platform itself because uh, that was a, a case that we hadn't catered for. So we, we hadn't really considered 
uh, what would happen. Uh, so as we would push these messages, uh, sorry, it was into Redis, not into Acute, into Redis. Um, our Redis instance was was getting full and running out of memory. And additionally, because of the way that our architecture had been set up, this was the same Redis that was used for our sessions, uh, which then meant that users weren't able to log in or they were being logged out sporadically. And uh, there was there was a lot of troubles. Um, and so we, we learned a lot from that. And as much as we, tr we were thankful that some really good practices were put into place to, to handle this type of situation. It hadn't quite been executed in a, in a way that was, um, I guess, really, really long lasting. So we, we, we learned a lot and we've fed that back into our processes to, to prepare better in the future. And one of, one of the ways that we were thinking about this was to split the uh, ownership of the different infrastructure pieces, but also change uh, to be different types of components. So we still have our sessions as uh, Redis based, but then for these downstream integrations, we would use a queue and move it to a proper managed FIFO queue. So that way we, we don't have to worry about it so much. The other real big advantage of this is the processing of those messages can then be handled by a separate service or a, another API itself. And that's something that our, our main API no longer has to worry about. It just creates a message and doesn't even uh, have that integration itself anymore. And yeah, really it's, it's a nice way to split things up. Uh, it's, it's quite nice to see. One of the other advantages here in terms of circuit breaking is it means that uh, we can bring some humans into the to the management of these services. And so we could have a separate uh, UI, for instance, that would let uh, engineers or, or somebody manage what services may or may not be hit in our API calls themselves. So we, we may know that there's going to be planned maintenance for a particular integration. So we can go in and we can uh, take that fuse out. So that way the circuit's broken for that particular integration and we won't be making those API calls and the messages will be stored and we can process them later. The next point I wanted to cover was around caching. And I feel that uh, this topic has changed a lot over the past, uh, let's say 10, 15 years. Uh, I remember back at Yahoo, this was a very, very different situation to what I see in recent years. And so I wanted to cover a bit about that now. So with our architecture here, we can see that there's now these two new components in the bottom left-hand corner. And for, for this, uh, there's a caching layer with a uh, store. And in this case, the analogous uh, services would be uh, CloudFront with an S3 bucket and primarily just for serving static assets. And so we can, we can use similar concepts here for our API itself, uh, but I'll cover that in a, in a few minutes. Uh, the idea being that uh, instead of processing every single request that comes in with our own infrastructure, we can offload this to, in this case, a CDN, uh, a content delivery network, uh, because there are many edge servers that sit much closer to the consumers of those, uh, the requesters of those assets. And so it's faster and it's a lot uh, easier to, to get that content to all of those locations. And so early on in my career, uh, I joined Yahoo 7 as a software engineer and the tech stack just blew my mind at the time. And this was back in 2008. And what what we had were was this kind of a five layer type of a setup uh, where there's this sort of edge cache, there's a load balancer uh, and then uh, like compute instances. So just servers that would handle 
API calls or various um, web traffic. And then there was a set of internal AP APIs. And those internal APIs also had a cache layer. Uh, and so there was this sort of multiple layers of caching that was happening. And I, I had never really thought about that before. And uh, the reason why I say that I feel like things have changed a lot is because I never really see this architecture anymore. And it's primarily that caching as a, th as a concept is seen as more of the asset based. And really there's not much uh, that I see about using caching for APIs themselves. And so for, if we were to think about that, uh, how we would use it, if we look at this architecture that's been building up, uh, we can place a uh, caching layer in front of our uh, compute instances. And that way, any API calls that we know the data is uh, not static, but doesn't change very often, or is used in such a way that it makes sense for that data to be exactly the same for a period of time, we can place a caching layer uh, in the middle here. And that way our compute instances don't have to do as much heavy lifting. And it also means that our database doesn't have to do as much heavy lifting. And we can serve responses back to our consumers very quickly uh, once the cache is primed. So one, uh, there's there's a couple of tools that are or products that are that are really good for this. Um, the one that comes to mind for me is Apache Traffic Server. Uh, it was it was great at being able to to have this sort of transparent proxy cache layer type thing. And one of the additional features that it had was this uh, push cache ability. So not only could you just have standard requests cached in this layer, so they were they were responsive to consumers, you could also tell Apache Traffic Server when there was new data available for a particular cache key. And in this case for the API, the, API, uh, the cache keys are the path uh, for the API request itself, uh, the full URI really. Uh, so it would include query parameters and uh, whatever, whatever else would come through. Uh, but it, of course it was all configurable. So and um, it's, it's quite nice to work with. The next topic uh, to touch on uh, was around performance over time. And in terms of resilience, this for me is a little bit more about uh, having some due diligence and confidence in, in what our services are and how they work and making sure that everything is uh, up and running as we expect it to be. So what we want to do is, is measure how things are and get a baseline over a certain time and then keep track of this and see what sorts of improvements or uh, ways that we can make sure that we meet the expectations of consumers. So one good instance of this, um, and much like what we had happen at Deputy, uh, we can see these, these trend graphs with uh, forecasting in play. So, uh, for our issue with our downstream API provider, uh, we could have a uh, what is it a, a number of keys in our Redis, Redis cache, so we could see uh, that the the Redis is filling up a lot quicker than what it should, and we might see that there it would be forecasted to reach the maximum size of the cluster, and so we would know that something's not right, and we would be able to uh, like flip the circuit before there's a problem and before we lose any uh, any requests from consumers. So if we, if we keep an eye on the different components of our API and the, the different bits and pieces and we have good alerts and good monitors in place, then we can readily handle when things don't quite go right or we can feed these back into our APIs themselves to to have them adapt and change as necessary. And circuit breaking is a fantastic way to do that. The last point I wanted to cover was around recovering from disaster. 
And there's many different types and degrees of disaster, and so there's many different ways to recover. But there's a few very specific points to keep in mind, and each of these are specific to, to situations, uh, but they can cascade from smaller to much larger failures, and uh, there may be very uh, different ways of approaching how to, to handle these situations. Uh, and there's a few key things to keep in mind, uh, things like uh, making sure that there are data backups and uh, having some redundancy in those backups. So that way, if there's catastrophic disaster, then can always recover. And the points that sort of fit into this category are, are really just these five. Um, and for me, the infrastructure as code is probably the most important because it gives a very quick way to be able to rebuild an entire API setup uh, with, with minimal disruption uh, rather than having to like build servers by hand or click around in various uh, cloud provider UIs to, to reconstruct everything. Uh, having it as code makes it a lot quicker to work with. And then, yeah, making sure you've got a disaster recovery plan, testing it regularly, and just making sure that there's a lot of redundancy. And so to bring everything together, uh, if we plan our API with a, with a resilient mind, uh, mindset, then we can avert disaster. And then if we do actually have disaster, then we can always prepare for that as well, uh, making sure that we can recover timely and with minimal disruption to consumers. We can use uh, concepts like circuit breakers and exponential backoffs to handle downstream failures. And there's a lot of good uh, uh, practices to help improve resilience, generally like having good API response structures. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alan. It's, a, it's an awesome presentation. Um, we uh, don't actually, we've got a, about three minutes left, but we don't actually have any questions that have shown up in the chat. So I'll just I'll voice that now to remind if anybody wants to put a question in there, we've still got, got three minutes left. Um, Meanwhile, I'll pose one of my own, if that's okay. Uh, though yeah, not, sure. specific, not specific to the content of your presentation, but I noticed your, your Twitter handle is Serial Boy. And I was wondering if you yes. could shed some light at how that, uh, how that came about. Uh, I started university back in 2003 at uh, UNE in Armadale. And uh, I lived on campus for a year and a half before I moved into town. Uh, with some friends. Uh, but while I was living on campus, uh, I didn't enjoy the food very much. <laughs> um, it was all fully catered for, but uh, there, there were a lot of foods that I just didn't enjoy. Uh, but there was always cereal available in the kitchen. And so I used to get one of these big bowls and have many, many scoops of cereal, like eight different types at a time sort of thing and then maybe half a liter of milk and that would be my dinner. Uh, and so I I kept the name from, what's that, 17 years now? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so we uh, still no, no question. Somebody says uh, no question, but awesome presentation. Thanks. So um, thank you. Kudos there. In in the remaining one minute that we have, that maybe that's not enough time. Do you have any um, any war stories or anything you want to want to uh, share with us or something about uh, related to your resiliency issue uh, topic? Uh, no, I, I the two that always come to mind are the two that I used in the presentation uh, around the 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 Redis and the queuing side of things. Uh, mm. But I think that's that's a, a good call out that I like to make as well is to remember to use the right tools for the job. So if you're going to queue data up, then use a queue. Uh, mm -hmm. Even though something like Redis is fast and there's a lot of libraries that exist for languages to use Redis as a queue, there's better queuing mechanisms out there. Uh, so that that's... In some ways, that's more of a, a personal bugbear that I have, uh, and I like to bring that up occasionally or when I have an opportunity, um, partly because it makes me feel better to say it out loud. <laughs> Fantastic. 
All right. Well, that takes us right to time. So thank you so much, Alan, for your presentation. Um, everybody knows how to get in touch with you now. So um, great. And we'll move on to our, our next topic. Thanks, Alan. Thank you.